good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, <laughs> uh, we tonight, well, not tonight, but this evening, uh, Dr. Uh, Begum Bashtash is with us. Thank you, Begum, for uh, coming to BCB and uh, agreeing to uh, deliver this lecture. Begum Bashtash is a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Fundamental Rights at the Hurry School. Her research interests are in the fields of migration, human rights, political theory, gender, and sexuality studies with a focus on EU and Turkey. She received her PhD in geography from the University of California, Los Angeles, and her MA in art history from the University of California, Riverside. Her BA was in sociology at Boazit University, Turkey. Before joining the Hurdy School, she was an Einstein fellow at Humboldt University in Berlin at BIM, uh, BIM where she worked on the spatial politics of solidarity and care among Afghan refugees and rights defenders in Greece. She also worked full-time as a human rights campaigner at Amnesty International Turkey for six years. She has a bi-weekly TV program titled On the Move with Begum Bashtash on Medioscope TV in English and Turkish, where she discusses current issues on migration with different guests. As a critical feminist geographer, her current research titled In the Making of New Europe, Embodied Politics of borderlands and refugee resilience, aims to contribute to migration and border studies by examining the reconstruction of EU borderlands at multiple scales through the governance of migration, particularly in Greece and the Balkan routes. Um, without further ado, I leave the mic to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. And I guess I'll start my presentation right away without wasting in, any time. So my title is um, Militarization of Migration, Spatial Politics of European Borderlands. Um, first, I will start with talking a, li a little bit about the situation that we have observed recently at the Polish-Belarusian border. Since the past summer, Belarus is accused of pushing migrants and refugees towards its borders with Lithuania, Latvia, and Poland. The situation at the Polish-Belarusian borders hit the headlines in August when 32 Afghans who tried to cross over to Poland from Belarus uh, were trapped in the no man's land between the two countries. A digital investigation by Amnesty International later proved that the Polish guards pushed them back. For weeks they were refused to enter to Poland and Belarus wouldn't allow them to return to Minsk. The European Court of Human Rights issued interim measures on 25th of August and decided Poland to provide people with food, water, clothing, medical care, and temporary shelter. Poland, of course, failed, failed to comply. Instead, on December 2, Poland described, uh, sorry, Poland declared a state of emergency in the region and barred journalists, NGOs, and medical aid from entering the three kilometer area at the border and criminalize the locals who still seek ways to help refugees stuck in the dense forest area. The situation took a turn for the worse on, when on November 18, Belarus pushed at least 1,000 people towards the Polish border. As a response, Poland deployed additional border guards, police, and military on the border. People trying to cross over the barbed wires and border crossings were dispersed with tear gas and water cannons. We all watched it live as it happened, as both sides of the border lined up armies and the tension peaked of a possible military conflict with migrants and refugees standing in between. Surveillance technologies were utilized to deter people on the move in all possible ways. Poland sent out SMS messages that would detect all mobile phones in the targeted area and the messages read, in quote, the Polish border is sealed. Belarus authorities told you lies. Go back to Minsk. Don't take any pills from Belarusian soldiers. Another um, SMS the next day said, Poland won't let migrants pass to Germany. It will protect its border. Don't get fooled. Don't try to take any action. After long days and nights in extreme cold temperatures and without access to basic needs, Belarusian authorities moved some people to a nearby warehouse where they were still around 1,000 people in the last weeks. About 2,000 people returned to their home countries. Many others are still in Belarus 
or in the thick, wet, cold forest, hoping to reach the EU and protection. Since August, at least about 15 people, but most likely more, have died due to harsh conditions. Hypothermia and starvation are the most common causes. Anna Albos, a volunteer in minority rights group, uh, wrote on Guardian on December 8, and she said, I read, people on the Poland-Belarus border have not eaten for weeks. Every few days, after a violent pushback over the barbed wire fence, they may get on an old potato from a Belarusian soldier, if they have money. They will share that with the kids. They have nothing to drink for days. Uh, or they drink swamp or rainwater, which causes stomach cramps and a deadening headache, further weakening them. Last Monday, a four-year-old girl, Eileen, went missing after the family was pushed back by the Pol Polish authorities at the barbed wires. The residents and activists have searched for the child in vain with temperatures at minus 15 degrees. The spokesperson for Poland's security services tweeted that the claims about Eileen are, in quote, another untrue story that became the basis of media hysteria without any verification. He criticized the activists for spreading false rumors. Eileen was wearing a red jacket when she was last seen. Some of the people who died at the borders have families in Germany, but they have no access to humanitarian visas or family reunification, because as von Hotum and Lacey underline, the hardest borders to pass, the fiercest borders are made out of paper, far away from the actual EU borders. They write in quote, Rather than concrete walls or fences guarded with guns, it is the externalized paper walls guarded by pencils and computers that are the first and most consequential line of defense of states, close quote. Thus, the border spectacle we see on the land and sea borders is the result of EU duplicity. While it criminalizes people who irregularly try to enter the EU, country, EU countries to seek protection, it makes it the only option that people face the politics of death, a catch-22, as Fitzgerald noted. The situation at the Polish-Belarusian borders were defined as a hybrid attack against the EU. The head of the EU Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, said it's a hybrid attack, not a migration crisis. In a, in a blog with my colleagues at Hertie School, we argued that it is neither a hybrid attack nor a migration crisis, but rather a crisis of protection, one we have too often seen in the, year, in the past years. Belarus is once again defined as a criminal state, and Lukashenko was accused of luring migrants who refused, who, who, who sorry, Lukashenko was accused of luring migrants and refugees with tourist visas for people mainly from Iraq, Afghanistan, Congo, Cameroon, and Syria, based on the false promise that they can easily cross over uh, to e European Union, even onto Germany. People arrived in Minsk with airplanes, and they were forced onto the borders of Poland, Lithuania, and Latvia. EU, lord, EU lords, interesting um, slip, EU leaders, called this a state-led smuggling, a criminal act, a criminal act, Lukashenko's attack with the intention to destabilize Europe. The German newspaper that Der Tagesspiel illustrated this with a Kalashnikov that used migrants as bullets and many similar illustrations joined the media. In a plenary debate on November 10, the members of the European Parliament strongly condemned the tactics of the dictatorial regime of Lukashenko, allegedly with Russia and Turkey, as a revenge of the existing sanctions against Belarus. Few MPs reminded the commitments to the rule of law and to protect the people in need, most outraged, screamed at Lukashenko and called for further sanctions increased security at the borders, and more walls and fences. Migrants and refugees were rarely mentioned, and if they were, they were at best victims of human trafficking by Belarus. While I watched this two hours of end of war, I felt as, it were as if we were preparing for a war, which was not only a political and economic one, but also with soldiers and arms. On December 1st, EU Commission tweeted, 
When one of us attacked, we are all attacked. Today, to protect our borders and to protect people, we are giving flexibility and support to Lithuania, Latvia, and Poland to manage the emergency at the EU's external border with Belarus without compromising on human rights, the tweet said. All of this enshrined on December 5, with a concert at the border of Poland and Belarus in support for the Polish uniformed services. As again von Hotum said in 2010, when studying power geometries, we must pay attention to how, when, and where spatial power differentials are given meaning and being translated in everyday practices by people. Because a, a border is much more than a protection wall alone. It's a means of saying, representing, glorifying, or resisting a here, a we, and a them. During the concert, the performance of European and Polish stars, while uniformed services uh, stood between a helicopter and a military plane as decoration, was indeed a bordering practice. Literally a theatrical spectacle of bordering. This was a day after a 38-year-old Iraqi Kurdish woman died at the same border. So much for the commission's call for not compromising on human rights. And one may only ask whether this is a war against migration and quite a real one. And so what is missing in this narrative? The weaponization of migration narrative denies that people at the borders are human beings with rights. It depicts people as objects that can be carried, pulled, pushed, thrown over the fences like a ball, but not as human beings with rights. Combating smuggling narrative, saying that they are just victims of smuggling, takes the agency out of their hands. EU occupies a twisted savior approach, arguing for returns without first asking migrants and refugees why they took such a risk, meaning without access to asylum procedures. People on the move become another passive plaything at the hands of the EU and its doomed political power game. The Commission's proposal further weakens their asylum rights and allows member states to ignore the inter international laws with increased use of detention and delaying asylum procedures with longer periods, where people would be at real risk of expulsions, pushbacks, and summary removals. We should also note that Poland has already taken actions to legalize pushbacks at its borders. The third, well, the third countries at EU's external borders have utilized the fear through construction of a threatening narrative that large numbers of people are moving towards Europe. This could be called a moral panic button in Europe, where the public gets a massive manipulative content, something the Hungarian Prime Minister Orban has extensively done. As Stan Cohen's words, the moral panic involves the exaggeration of existing phenomena picturing them as existential threats to the national community and explaining their causes by scapegoating and pointing to images of an enemy. The moral panic that constructs armies of migrants rushing to Europe, which is almost never accurate, is used to justify militarization slash defending of the borders, both the visible and the invisible ones. Massive spending on border security technologies, AI technologies such as lie detectors used on asylum seekers, air surveillance through drones, drones, helicopters, sensors, thermal cameras, motion detectors, guns, additional guards, sound cannons, war, um, so sound cannons, walls, barbed wires, CCTV surveil surveillance camps. The list goes on. Keeps Frontex in business as the EU institution with the largest budget under the pretense of innovation. Growing role and funding of the private sector companies with new technologies in migration management and with little or no regulation is another outcome as Petra Molnar in her work shows very elegantly. Poland's border with Belarus is becoming the latest front line for this technology with the country recently approving a 350 million euros wall with advanced cameras and motion sensors. So what about this EU's weak spot? 
Without doubt, Lukashenko aimed to pressure the EU and the member states to, to his political ends. There is no doubt over that. However, it is clear that it takes two to tango. We must ask how Lukashenko is allowed to make such moves. Obviously, Lukashenko is no genius. This is now an old trick, an already utilized toolbox by Turkey, Morocco, and Libya. EU leaders say Europe will not be blackmailed. Well, that should be the case, of course, because migration could, cannot be used as a mar mar bargaining chip. However, few ask how the EU is actually letting this happen repeatedly. It is argued that Belarus is trying to destabilize Europe. Well, then don't be destabilized. It's not so difficult. This is not a computer game where the EU stocks soldiers and builds a wall wherever people appear. Framing the events at the borders in such a militarist framework undermines a focus on migration, sustainable asylum policy, the rule of law, and the protection of human rights. If the EU abides by the <clears throat> rule of law <clears throat> with an effective migration policy that prioritizes uh, um, that prioritizes access to asylum procedures and alternative legal pathways that softens its paper borders, protects human rights based not on solidarity of return, but resettlement, then I can assure you Lukashenko could not use migration to threaten the EU. Because for that to happen, first the EU must shift its vision on migration as a threat, particularly a security threat. As I just said, it takes two to tango. If the EU does not abide by the international and European laws, asking that from authoritarian regimes like Lukashenko, like Erdogan, is just a wild goose chase. The truth is that the EU without a functioning system of responsibility sharing and an effective common asylum system, including the Dublin, depends on such authoritarian leaders at its immediate borders. EU puts itself at the mercy of third countries, because the so-called refugee crisis, in quote, stains the pro-EU project and it is facing a serious failure because the EU member states cannot seem to come to an agreement on protection. Thus, the EU relies on third countries, Morocco, Libya, Turkey, to hold migration and makes deals with them. Especially since 2015, EU urged to curb migration in the name of protecting lives at the borders and made a deal with Turkey known as the 2016 EU-Turkey Statement. This we call externalization of migration. The EU-Turkey deal promised political gains to Turkey, such as visa liber liberalization and resuming the EU accession dialogues with EU. As long as Turkey, and, oh, and of course, the humanitarian support to Turkey, which meant a lot of money, um, if the country would seal its land and sea borders with EU. This was a politically motivated, short-sighted, and an ad hoc solution, since when Turkey did not get what it wants, it claimed to open its borders in 2020, stirring a similar conflict. Though I have to say in parentheses that this brings problems. This comparison is problematic, and, and we can talk about this later if you like. And as we observed at the external borders with Belarus, EU remains vulnerable to the same trick. The EU denies learning from past experiences, and rather than abiding by the rule of law, it continues its warmongering narrative, criminalizing people on the move. While criticizing Lukashenko for using migrants for his political ambitions, the EU also uses migration as a bargaining chip to bow to human rights violations in these countries, antithetical to its proclaimed position in the world on peace and democracy. In exchange for keeping refugees out, it empowers and enables dictators, not only in their own territories, but also against the EU. In a blog to legitimize the measures taken by the EU, the commissioner Johansson wrote, in quote, the monster tactics of the Europe's last dictator will be clear for the world to see, close quote. But for Lukashenko to be the last, EU must stop mimicking the tools utilized by authoritarian regimes, rather must reclaim its self-proclaimed leadership and enforce migration and asylum policies that prioritizes human lives and protection rather than borders. 
Only such efforts would seal the right deal. Well, in a sense, also maybe Europe admits that it was never the focus of um, peace and freedom and equality, rule of law and so forth. There's always just goes with the flow, but that's another food for thought. Coming to the fortress Europe and the demise of the European Union. Since Trump is gone for now, remembering his big, fat, beautiful wall, when he said, we will build the wall and Mexico will pay for it, we might laugh at it now. But experts on US-Mexico border emphasize the lasting effects of his policies on the southern borders. At the plenary session with the MPs that I just noted before, they demanded further securitization of external borders. And the EU said they could pay for it. The economic cost of walls is considered more than its human cost. Even Finland recently revisited brainstorming on its vast eastern border with Russia and speculated on building a border fence through its dense taiga forest, which is about 1300 kilometers. Last 20 years of border studies show that the thrill of a borderless world did not last long. And today borders are strengthening and popping up everywhere, allegedly for our protection and security. And they are not just the concrete or steel walls of the traditional geographies. Um, COVID very brutally reminded us the inequalities of these borders in our everyday lives around the globe. However, we cannot ignore the rise of the right-wing right populist discourse, overzealous about the classic borders that claims our countries, our people first. Fortress Europe is indeed rising higher and higher. Remember Orban when he described migration in 2015 as an invasion and the migrants as poison. He said, we do not see them as Muslim refugees. We see them as Muslim invaders. Orban claimed there was a clear link between illegal migrants heading to Europe and a rising threat of terrorism, justifying his conservative government's uh, tough anti-migration stance. He said, our answer is clear. We would like to preserve Europe for Europeans. And this also requires an effort from the other countries. But there's something that we would not only like, but want to preserve Hungary for Hungarians. I would like to also remind, just remind that just this year in March, European Parliament declared itself an LGBTIQ freedom zone as a response to the deteriorating situation in Poland and Hungary. The resolution said that all LGBTIQ people in EU should enjoy the freedom to live and express their identity without the fear of intolerance, discrimination, or persecution. It also sought to ensure protection by demanding that all authorities across the EU to promote equality and fundamental rights, including LGBTIQ people. Poland and Hungary were clearly signaled out, signaled out, singled out and targeted. However, when the issue is migration and people irregularly entering the EU, we come to a deadlock that shows that fundamental rights are just for EU citizens, not for people on the move. In 2020, when Turkey claimed to open its land borders with Greece, von der Leyen visited Evros and said the land border and said, Greece is the shield of Europe, a role which Greece pro proudly confirms to perform. When the situation at the Polish borders escalated last month, the messaging was same and still very clear. We stand in solidarity with Poland to protect the borders. So Poland is back in the game. Migration has become such a threat that the EU is willing to give up rule of law and ignore the human rights violations, brutal and deadly pushbacks, starvation, death at the external borders of Poland, Greece, Croatia, Hungary, Spain, and more, even in daylight with impunity. Bordering practices show us that European values of the rule of law and protection of fundamental rights are tested against the far right discriminatory policies. In a similar vein, vein with von whom, whom Hotum and Lacey, who aimed in court at evaluating the overall justice and self harming reciprocity that EU's, borders, EU's border regime exerts on its political community as a whole and defined it as a suicidal paradox for EU, 
I also believe that European identity is being restructured from the borderlands and the conditions endured by the bodies on the move is entangled with the fate of the EU as they mirror the vulnerabilities of Europe. To paraphrase Van Houten and Lacey, how borderlands are reconstructed and imagined today through violence could be both a symptom and a consequence of the demise of the European ethos. The walls as paper or steel, they are built around, that they are, that they are built around do not just exclude people from entering. It also frames us, imprisons us within that specific frame. How EU treats people at its borders and spatially organizes its borderland is a precursor to what might happen to its citizens. The threat is not coming from beyond the borders, but within, from distancing itself from self-proclaimed values of human rights and democracy, from criminalizing solidarity with people on the move. This is already happening in Greece, Poland, Hungary, not just in Belarus and Turkey. How many times we heard, oh, that would not happen here. And it happens over and over again. And Greece is an example of that developing story. Human rights violations against people on the move and now against, in own, against its own citizens in Greece framed within a kind of a love and hate relationship with the EU, troubled with the austerity measures, but blanketed with the support on the external borders, offers us a glimpse of what might Europe be facing. In July 2019, there was a national election in Greece. The, new, the conservative Neo Democratia New Democracy Party, led by Mitsotakis, won the majority of what? New Democracy Party claimed it can fix the economy and appropriated a right-wing populist anti-migration discourse, promising to control migration by strengthening the borders. Border security for Greece is equaled with national security, making migration a security concern. As Neo Democratia came into power, it initiated a number of actions to strengthen borders and put new legal measures that violate asylum seekers' right to individualized, effective, and fair access to asylum application procedures. These range from temporarily halting accepting asylum applications to changing national law to define Turkey as a safe third country to return asylum seekers from Syria, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Somalia, without even taking their applications on the grounds of inadmissibility. Greek Coast Guards are violently pushing dinghies ding to enter Greek waters back to Turkey, also engaging in mass and illegal collective expulsions from its land and sea borders. Lighthouse and others published a very detailed investigation that proved that pushbacks are occurring violently at sea under the eye of the EU agency Frontex. There are visual testimonies of people arriving in Greece and even placed in detention centers, then bussed and pushed back to Turkey. Greek authorities deny allegations, obviously, not, they are not conducting investigations, but New York Times recently released a story that Greek border guards mistook an EU interpreter as an asylum seeker and forced him back to Turkey. While a couple of years ago, tens of Sea Watch organizations monitored the Greek waters to welcome arrivals, the governments criminalized all and stopped their monitoring activities. Sarah Mardini and Sean Binder with 22 others are now facing 25 years of imprisonment for merely helping refugees arriving on the Greek island of Lesbos. While solidarity groups are increasingly criminalized, new legislative measures on NGOs working with refugees are particularly the ones working at camps are limited and they are no longer allowed to enter the camps. Just recently, Refugee Support Aegean, one of the most prominent NGOs in Greece, is rejected for registration by the substantive ground that its work includes supporting people to deportation to people subject to deportation proceedings, which is even contradictory to Greek legislation, let alone EU law that protects even rejected asylum seekers in need of assistance. All of these have further deteriorated the lives of the refugees in the camps 
and also hinders any monitoring of human rights violations occurring in the camps. My work earlier showed that Lesbos as an island, as a laboratory of EU migration management policies, has been kept in this perpetual state of emergency. It was once a transit zone from Turkey to Western Europe. Now it's a warehouse of gross human rights violations where thousands of asylum seekers are trapped in camps in abhorrent conditions. Atrocities of the Moria camp were well known and there's no need to recite them here. But after the Moria fire in September 20, the refugees were forced to move into a temporary camp built over three days, which would prove to be a lot more, a lot worse than Moria and highly surveilled by security forces. Physical and mental health of the asylum seekers, scarred with war and violence before their arrival, have reached alarming conditions on the island, and suicide attempts among the children have risen. Children are usually the red line for everyone. But in Greece, children suffering from severe mental health problems, even killing themselves, is ignored behind increasingly locked camps. A new closed camp, a new closed controlled camps on the five Greek hotspot islands, Lesbos, Chios, Samos, Leros, and Kos, are constructed now by the collaboration between the Greek government and the EU Commission. Closed control camps on Samos, Kos, and Leros opened in the past couple months. Located miles away from the center, circled with layers of barbed wires, cameras, besides other border technologies, these new camps are the prisons built by the European Union money at the external borders. Past summer, when I visited the site where the new center on Lesbos will be built, it took me about 30 minutes to drive, and 20 minutes of that drive was just rocks, horses, goats, and groves arriving right next to the waste dump of the island. Amnesty International recently visited the new camp on Samos Island and said this camp more closely resembles a prison than a place to house people seeking safety. The human rights organizations claims that asylum seekers on Samos are being detained illegally by Greek authorities. Since November 17, as those without valid asylum cards are barred from leaving the, leaving the camp for an indef indefinite period. Samos camp can house up to 3000 people and it is equipped with a rigid system of containment and surveillance, including a doubled, double barbed, um, doubled barbed wire mental fencing, metal fencing, CCTV throughout, and 24 seven presence of patrol patrolling police forces and privately contracted security officers. An Afghan man told Amnesty that before this decision, he was active outside the camp. He said in quote, I was studying English and volunteered outside the camp. In the last days, I feel I'm a prisoner. In the old camp, at least I had my freedom. Camp speci speciality obviously determines what happens inside. But as Minka and other camp studies show, we must study how camp thinking also affects the production of political geographies of the outside the camps. Violent policing of over irregular movements of people at borders and the formation of camps, particularly the institutional ones with EU's external, within EU's external borders, change borderland geographies inwards. The camps have a European history from the colonies to the homeland. Such genealogies are imprinted in the modern camps at the external borders. How people are treated in these spaces are shameful and must be called on. But also we need to recognize the possibility that they reflect inwards. How Greece treats refugees and asylum seekers, the so-called migration management, pervade into the entirety of Greece's ruling party's governance, including its citizens. Impunity of border guards merge with police brutality in the streets of Athens and Thessaloniki against oppositional groups and students particularly. Press freedom is increasingly under threat in Greece. A Greek journalist noted that he discovered that he's subjected to surveillance by the Greek National Intelligence Service due to his group of, due to his and his group of independent journalists called Solomon were included on a list <coughs> with people in the migration field. A month ago, a Dutch journalist who dared to challenge Mitsotakis on pushbacks during a press conference 
got yelled at by the prime minister, and then she was forced to leave Greece after being attacked and threatened in social media and physically assaulted. Furthermore, a new Greek legal amendment as an update of an existing criminal code banning fake news makes sharing fake news a criminal offense charged with prison sentences up to three months. Under the premise to protect people from COVID misinformation, this law is a serious risk that could be used to punish media professionals, civil society, and anybody who criticizes or takes issues with the government policies. You now risk jail for speaking out on important issues of public interest if the government claims it's false. Human Rights Watch reported on this. Turkey, on a side note, is undergoing the same legal challenges that would make dissemination and fake news criminal offenses. So Greece is just a little following behind with three years of imprisonment where Turkey um, asks for five years of imprisonment instead. Um, and when I, to the end, in the end, I, I love TV shows. My colleagues, my friends would know that. I want to, some of you might have watched The Handmaid's Tale. Um, the first season was great. Um, then the rest is a bore. But um, in the first season, there was this quote, which became very popular. The quote says, now I am awake to the world. I was asleep before. That's how we let it happen. When they slaughtered Congress, we didn't wake up. When they blamed terrorists and suspended the constitution, we didn't wake up either then, then either. Nothing changes instantaneously. In a gradual heaving bathtub, you'd be boiled to death before you knew it. Trust me, I'm not a conspiracy theorist or an apocalyptic, but I know something about how authoritarianism creeps in. So in my last words, I want to refer to my, my, my own kind of, I guess, take on this. Um, bordering practices are changing and they're also changing our relations, desires, imaginations. EU becoming a warmongering fortress, an image we know too well from all times or just the Game of Thrones, but indeed a foretell of a possible dystopian future. What is happening at the external borders of the EU cannot be ignored or normalized. Academically, we use terms such as biopolitics, necropolitics, but simply, we cannot just let ourselves get crushed by the walls being built around us. We must resent and resist. I know that usually when I describe the situation, the horror stories has paralyzing effects. It makes us think, what can I do? So, so maybe I can tell you what keeps me going. There's a growing literature on borderscapes that holds on to hope. For that, I suggest we look at the resilience and the resistance of people on the move. After the fire of the Moria camp in September, 2020, with my good friend, Francisca, uh, journalist Francisca Grillmeyer, and I were walking in the ad hoc camping area where we talked with people who just survived a massive fire. On top of a two story building, there was a group of Afghan girls. They were just sitting. Without even realizing what I do, I just started waving at them. They waved back at me. And then they made me a sign to wait and they grabbed their posters. The posters said, no camp, no jail, just freedom. Another one said, it's better to die for freedom instead of spending the whole life in prison. We took photos with their permission, waved a bit more, sent kisses up in the air. And then right when we were going our way, we saw a young boy, a nine, year, nine years old, though he looked much younger. We sat next to him. He didn't talk much. He looked at us with a quite blank face and plainly asked, what time is freedom? So why I continue is because I really need to ask the same question with him and follow it through. Cause reading through Harney and Morton's The Undercommons, Fugitive Planning and Black Study, I know that we must realize that the walls are not just bad for some, they are bad for all of us. Walls in whatever form are killing us all. We do not know what is thereafter. So in, quote, in quotation I hear, but once we tear this shit down, we will inevitably see more, see definitely, and feel a new sense of wanting and being and becoming. Because as Harney and Morton said, 
we owe each other the indeterminant. We owe each other everything. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Begim. Thank you for this wonderful and very provocative uh, lecture and very depressing, may I say, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, what I'm gathering from here is that uh, basically the EU hardline on the militarization of the border is uh, leading to the de-democratization of uh, the periphery of Europe, um, including parts of the European Union. Um, so basically Europe is undoing itself uh, by trying to protect its borders. Uh, it's ironic uh, and really sad and quite visible, in fact, um, yet not understood because of all the hatred. Um, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> Aisha wrote there that, um, what about the people who are writing those regulations to build the walls and borders? I mean, my argument is that they, this is going to, you know, wrap them up as well. Um, nothing's going to protect anybody in, in my argument, but I don't think, um, I mean, there is a counterproductive effort in many instances, especially like the ways that we saw in the EU-Turkey deal, that the EU-Turkey deal was made in an attempt to humanize as against the Orban's policies, um, like the people or the policies like of people like Orban. But in the end, it became counterproductive. The efforts of the EU to compete against these arguments actually turned around itself and actually be, today, what we see at the external borders is Orban's fences and borders. Um, and, I, and I think there is another adding that, that is there any study on them, what kind of people they are, what kind of milieu they are living in coming through. I honestly don't know if, I'm sure there are um, scholars studying um, the bureaucrats. I think it's always very interesting studying the paperwork trail of bureaucracy is always a brilliant work. I think um, I find it really interesting, but as far as I know, um, I'm not aware of, of these in, in these studies, sorry. Um, so begin, my question would be, uh, what is the role of the media in this moral uh, panic that you mentioned of, I mean, Clearly, it's not very positive. Uh, they're contributing to this quite willfully. Um, and yet we don't see a counter narrative, strong enough counter narrative from center of left uh, media in Europe, only from very left and socialist media outlets. Uh, and what is this, uh, what's the reason for this? Um, I don't know what the term would be, but um, participation in this uh, um, discourse. Well, um, supposedly I'm just, you know, yeah. left of center media outlets. I mean, in, in, in Greece, first in Greece, if I mention that there is very few independent media left in Greece, especially with COVID funding, we realize that actually there's a severe corruption going on in Greek media where the Greek authorities are only actually allowing the mainstream or right-centered media to develop. And the right and the left wing, the independent media is being, you know, left on the edges. Um, but the problem is like, for example, even the media that actually seemingly is for the rights of the refugees, they are falling into the same narrative. It's like the, Kalashnikov that I've mentioned, like those type of news that emerged at, at, the, at the beginning of November when Belarus pushed people to the Polish borders, even the, the you know, more liberal or, you know, left um, have targeted Lukashenko as using refugees, using refugees as pawns within, you know, as bullets in a Kalashnikov. It's like they don't even recognize that they are Inter that they have internalized that militaristic argument 
that defines this conflict as a political one, as a military one, rather than like not seeing them as things, as objects. Even the left depicts these people as objects. Of course, this this you know neither EU nor the media is homogenous. And, and there are differences. But one of the other problems is, you know, newspapers in Germany have some kind of fetish over Greece. So whatever happens on the Greek islands, whatever happens on the Aegean Sea or the Mediterranean, especially in the German media, gets really, really highly circulated. But there's also now a developing sense of numbness, yet another fire, yet another death. Nobody really gets mobilized, you know, like when Belarus, you know, pushes people, there is a surge of the media, of the interest, people, you know, get stressed. And then we move on to another crisis. In the last three years, we had seen this in the last two years, not even three years, maybe less. 2020 is the when um, Turkey pushed people to the borders of Greece. And then this year in April, we saw at Morocco doing it at the Spanish borders. And now this, so like this is not happening in, in big time differences. And people have started to become immune to this. So there is actually publication and like it is the Lighthouse report that published on Croatian, but that's that I need to emphasize because now we realize that it takes a village because of the whole secrecy, of the whole state of exception and emergency situation that is framed in these borderlands, journalists are not allowed to enter these sites. So the three kilometer zone in Poland, the camps in Greece, Croatia, the same. The, the journalists do not have access. So to be able to report on these things, what we see as the lighthouse and Spiegel all corroboration, it's like, many journalists actually worked together in the publication of that report. It takes a village because you have to triangulate, triangulate and create these. And that actually uh, triggered the EU parliament. And there was an investigation and push. Croatian authorities claimed that they will do investigation. But of course, that investigation will lead up to firing of a few border guards and the whole policy will continue. You know, for when it comes to Greece, Greece denied allegations and kept asking for a report, like a evidence. And the lighthouse says, like, we can't give you the evidence. This is like, you know, our sources. We can't give you the sources. Um, but in that sense, so these type of uh, reports that are done as a team of journalists from Germany, Italy, Croatia, Greece, all around the Europe are having some impact, but the overall uh, change in media is, is, is in alliance with that militarist narrative. Thank you. Uh, Luna has a question, please. Uh, can you? Yes. Yeah, thank you so much for speaking. Um, it's, it was really insightful and I loved your reference to The Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> um, I was wondering, you spoke a bit about like surveillance at the border and like I've been reading a lot about like, okay, this idea of like, oh, smart borders and more humane, but actually it's just like an excuse for like using a lot of money um, for all of these cameras and surveillance. And I was wondering if you know, um, I think you spoke about the Belarus Polish border and cameras, like are these in? Is the footage then in public domain or is it in like private companies domain? Like what happens to the like to the camera surveillance footage? It might be a bit specific. I don't know if you know more about that. I'm trying to understand what specific, can you repeat specifically what you just asked? <laughs> yeah, um, so what happens with all of these recordings? Like in whose domain are they? Are they from, are they in private companies like governments, public available? Like what happens with it? I'm I'm definitely not an expert on um, surveillance technologies. Petra Molnar is actually going to publish a book soon on this, and um, but some of her work is already published. Petra Molnar, I would really highly suggest to look at her work because she actually directly addresses 
the question you pose. But from what I read from her work, I understand that this is also granted to private companies with very little regulation. And, and of course, the she she competes with this whole humanitarian discourse that it actually creates potentially more violence and violates human rights of the refugees, especially like, for example, the lie detectors um, that are used in asylum interview procedures. These are completely outrageous and none of them are actually humane, let alone, you know, like, for example, think of the sound, um, sound, or the sound cannons at the at the Greek Turkish border. Now those are like deafening basically, and it, it is actually harmful to physically to people who are trying to cross. So none of these are humane, obviously, um, but it comes to ask like, who's making money out of these? The one of the issues is like, why is there so much, you know, in, it, it makes me coming from Turkey, it always construction and who gets rich is always like a funny question in a sense stressful in itself, I guess. But um, so I don't know where they are recorded, how they are kept, but I doubt there is any um, regulation of confidentiality or any of that sort as, as, as they are not regulated properly. But Petra would be the first, the, the right, correct person to answer this. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Thank you. I will look her up. And I have one final question um, in this, uh, well, this discourse as it is uh, spreading left and right in the media among policymakers uh, and the moral panic, what I'm noticing is that uh, parties that would normally and should normally be uh, very pro-immigration and anti-racist uh, are becoming more and more silent in Europe and in many parts of the world. And it seems to me, and I'd like to ask you this, that their main concern is the rise of the um, uh, far right, racist parties, xenophobic parties. And um, to this, they responded with the idea that if immigration, especially if irregular immigration is causing the uh, rise of the far right, the way to uh, stop this from happening is to stop immigration. They've created this kind of causation in their minds as if immigration is the cause of uh, extremism in Europe or North, North America or wherever. Um, so do you think that would be a right analysis about the attitude of uh, many leftist parties? And um, do you think there's a way to, uh, if it is correct, uh, if you think this is correct, there is a way to actually turn around that kind of thinking that immigration causes extremism, uh, that the reaction, uh, the, the, the immigrants are responsible for the violent reaction that they're getting from uh, people in Europe. Um, I think overall, I would agree with the quietness that they are not making a huge fuss about this. Um, and there are a lot of left center um, groups that actually um, try to, you know, try to do what you're saying. But on the other hand, I think over the few years, I've been seeing very significant number of European parliamentarians that are not necessarily, you know, yelling and screaming and mimicking the right wing politicians, but doing the getting the job done. Like, for example, the Luftbrücke, the, the way that how Afghans were being resettled back to after the 15th of August, um, Taliban's fall, you know, how, you know, some politicians were supporting and involved in the resettlement of, um, of Afghans or on, you know, EU, Turkey, I'm sorry, Greece um, pushbacks, you know, they were very brutally attacked. But we don't see the same bodily performance from those people that we see the same that, that we see from the right wing, you know, or the you know AfD or the you know the the Golden Dawn type of people. So I think that that kind of in a way affects how we perceive how they work. But overall, 
you're right that in a sense that when we look at their, um, I'm not an expert, obviously, but when I don't, what I don't see is a very clear, very open stand in like, let's say election campaigns. Like uh, we don't see that very clearly anywhere, including Turkey or elsewhere. So migration remains as a taboo, as a scare in that sense. But they are, I have, I have to say that, um, <clears throat> They are very consistent and they pushed Frontex, they push um, Greek authority. If there is an investigation against, if there is an ombudsman in question, all of those in Greece is thanks to those left um, politicians in the European Parliament, in my, in my opinion, as much as I've talked to them and seen them. Um, but, but again, in a sense, yes, we do need to make sure that there is a discourse in the left or in the left center even, that does separate these two things from one another. To, to, to even because when you look at Daniel Trilling many years ago wrote a amazing piece on the Golden Dawn's history in Greece in the Guardian. And it shows that the power of these far right groups is just the, and their effects on migration is an outcome of who they are. Even when you look at those far right groups, what they do is not a reaction, but a, res, a, 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 a kind of a consequence of their right wing position. So in that sense, you really have to dismantle these, um, these suppositions, these ideas, and actually fight for fundamental rights for anyone, as if EU, you know, wants a Nobel Prize nominee or winner, I don't remember, but something like that into in recently, now is completely not abiding by its own rule of law. Thank you. I said, yeah, I said it was the last question, but I do have one final question. <laughs> so uh, do you think Frontex can exist uh, and be reformed? Uh, I, I mean, my personal opinion is that its very existence is just wrong. I don't know how you can reform uh, an institution whose very existence basically reinforces extremely racist and uh, divisive, uh, you know, uh, stereotypes and a world which is extremely divided. Um, so, do you think there's room for uh, a functional uh, Frontex or Frontex-like organization that is somewhat not um, horrible? I mean, again, you know, of course, from the activist side of myself, the human rights Frontex, abolish ICE, abolish Frontex, you know, ICE and Frontex are not very different from one another in my perspective. Um, ICE in the United States, for those who are not um, familiar. Um, <clears throat> but I think, of course, when you think about international, you know, you are the international political, you know, expert. I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm a geographer. But from what I see, if you are in, you know, looking into this, and if this actually, not, this is not a migration problem. This is what I've been arguing. This is a political science debate, part of the political relations, international relations issue. None of these are actually what we see in Polish Belarus borders or anywhere else. All of these are actually a matter of international politics <clears throat> that is made to look like it's about migration. So in that sense, if you think in that sense, um, yes, you have, there, there are ways that these institutions function um, with, with human rights. I mean, there needs to be some people at the borders that deal with um, asylum applications. There has to be people who search and rescue for, um, I mean, you know, I have been talking about this with, with you and others before that <clears throat> actually what NGOs are doing at the Mediterranean, at the Aegean islands and so forth, it is the responsibility of EU authorities if they actually abide by the law. So, so at, the end, at the end of the day, a Frontex seems of course antithetical, but there has to be some institutions that functions 
by the human rights law to effect, provide effective asylum applications, to ensure that nobody dies at the sea, to make sure that there are no sh more shipwrecks in the Mediterranean. But what they do right now is obviously they, when they see a ship, they notify the Libyan authorities in the Mediterranean to pull back people, despite the atrocities in Libya. Um, at, but what it has to do is actually either engage with Sea Watch, Ocean Viking, you know, all of all of these other rescue ships at least. And because many times these type of rescue ships in the Mediterranean say that they are not being contacted, they are not being let help, you know. So even if they do the minimal, they have the technology to protect lives. They are just using it to, to deter lives actually. So, so there has to be, you know, YASO has to be functioning properly. All of these IOM is just doing returns. Frontex is just doing returns. Returns might be an inevitable end of asylum applications for some, but it's logic, its essence is so flawed. How it defines migrants, how it defines refugees is so flawed at the moment that maybe we need to you know, pull this shit down, as I just said, and then recreate institutions rather than, you know, like when you break up with someone, trying a second time is usually, you know, building a relationship on rubbles. Maybe, you know, like instead of the rubbles, we need new institutions that yeah. begin with human rights. Yeah, true. I mean, that's the problem with a lot of uh, carceral institutions, border institutions, that they are uh, so fundamentally uh, flawed in their design that uh, trying to reform that uh, that is useless. Just getting rid of them and building a new institution is much easier uh, in a weird way. Uh, I, let's hope that um, now the green the well let's the traffic light coalition in Germany claim that they will work against these um, you know people dying in the uh, Mediterranean. Let's see if they can keep their promise because that they haven't said anything else about migration really. Um, but uh, as this is happening, of course, it's being fed by uh, the denaturalization laws, the new denaturalization law in uh, the UK, which basically can, uh, I mean, crazy things are happening and they're so connected. Yeah, um, yeah one only feels uh, desperation when, you know, when we follow these things. But thank you so much, Bigum. Um, thank you for as, inviting me. Thank you. Uh, as usual, I learned a lot. Um, and this should be a call to action to anyone who cares, really, uh, that this is happening and that we can uh, and do have a role in preventing this from happening as individuals, as political actors uh, in our respective countries, uh, and to speak up for the uh, migrants uh, who cannot speak because they don't have a voice. Um, until they come in, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I just like to repeat, you know, the young boys, you know, question, what time is freedom? I think we all have to ask that.